In this episode, I'm going to paint a forumware Warhound Titan. If you're not familiar with what those are, stay tuned here at Bunker 6. Due to this Imperial Warhound already being purchased a few years before I even thought I was going to make a YouTube channel about Epic, I had already primed and magnetized this model. The magnetization has only occurred on the arms of the Warhound and the weapons. Pretty simple, it was just a set of rare earth magnets super glued into place, then I used a white rattle can to initially prime the model. Now I'm moving in with some black primer which I'm much more comfortable with using these days than let's say I was a few years ago with my airbrush. Using some Mission Models Black here, it's a really nice flat primer, it does a really good job. I could have worked from the white primer that's already here, but I know what I like and I much prefer to start from black, and so that's what we're going to do first. Now, I don't want to magnetize every single part of this Warhound, it is only going to be used for display purposes anyway, I'm not doing any gaming with this, so I will be pinning the legs. We're going to start by using a scalpel to create an initial hole, then move into actually using a hand drill to create a larger hole as you can see here in the legs and in the hip joints. Taking a paper clip here, getting rid of the plastic coating, pulling that off with the pincers, clipping the amount that I need, which is enough length to stick out from the hip joint and insert into the opposing hip joint. I'm just using some super glue gel here. I then add the stripped paper clip into the hip joint with the super glue gel in place. Just make some minor adjustments with the tweezers rather than using my fingers so I don't get super glue all over the place. Then I just have to make sure that the pins are sitting on the correct angle so when they are assembled, the leg and hip joint are both flush with each other. Some areas of the Ligio Osadex color scheme actually have the two colors of white and turquoise split together over a single body part. So I'm masking some areas that will require that in future. The head of the Warhound Titan will eventually be red, but I use Rhinox Hide as a nice, deep, rich base coat before I started applying the lighter reds over the top of it. When you see the term under highlight, like here for example, what that's referring to is something kind of similar to the Xenothor technique, where I'm actually adding a very bright layer that will then be overlaid by a much more transparent layer that's a complementary color to emphasize that additional layer that happens over the top. So for example, if we have a bright orange, this is going to be layered with a red transparency layer. It's going to make that red much more vibrant wherever that orange under highlight has occurred. I will also be repeating this technique with the turquoises and the whites on this entire model. So we start here with a very bright gray over the black, which is going to be one of our brightest points. And then on the left and the right side of the legs, we're actually going to be tapering off into darker sections to create that sort of panel contrast that's quite common with these Adeptus Titanicus panels. You want to really make sure that everything feels quite dynamic and not super flat and all the same color across the entire model. Now is a case of doing some additional masking on some of the other areas that I hadn't dealt with earlier. Aside from using masking tape, I'm also using post attack to make sure some areas are blocked off that I don't want to get hit with the airbrush later down the line. The white layer is then added to express the lightest points on the model. And also going from grey to white is a much better transition than jumping from say black all the way up to white. And with the airbrush we just make sure that the grey is still exposed when we add the black layer so I do get the transition that I'm hoping for. And before I start adding a ton of washes over the top of these previous layers, I need to lock in and protect the work I've already done by using some gloss varnish. Once I was happy with all of the gloss varnish work that I'd done on all of the white parts, I then moved my attention over to the turquoise side. And yes, I could have actually just held off adding the gloss varnish until the very end of finishing off the turquoise and white layers, but that would involve me being an intelligent person. And we all know that I'm not one of those. So there we are, I actually just did the gloss varnish a stage too early, but it's not too much of a big problem because it's protected and it's gonna be easier to clean if I do make some mistakes anyway. Now let's move on to the turquoise. 
As with the other colors, I'm making sure that I add this much brighter under highlight, which will then have a much more transparent turquoise layer added over the top, rather than me adding a lighter tone over the top of the turquoise, making things look a little bit unrealistic due to how big these panels are. It's much better if we can make these things look as natural as possible because these areas are very exposed and with a model this size it's important to make things look as realistic as possible. Obviously I want to have as much contrast on these models as possible but you have to do things the right way around and if you can do it whereby you put this brighter layer underneath and then add these transparent layers over the top you're going to have much more realistic and natural results. If the white is the brightest point then these blues are some of my darker points and then the turquoise layer that's going to be going over the top will be my mid-tone. We will be going even darker and even brighter, but this just seemed to be the most comfortable way of moving forward. I didn't have any recipes for this, I was kind of winging it and making it up as I went along and just seeing how the results were going. But I decided quite early on that I wanted to experiment with this zenithal technique throughout the entire process. And I'm quite happy with how smooth the results have been so far. I could have just used a brighter turquoise, but I do like the control that you get from having the pre-under highlight happening before and then adding these transparent layers over the top rather than adding a much more opaque paint straight off the bat we're actually doing these transparent layers that gives you a bit more control of how much density you want to add in terms of contrast and brightness now we're moving into some darker sections with the Drakenhof nightshade and then sealing everything together with a gloss varnish once again the gloss varnish is to make sure that when I add my Gulliman Blue wash the paint doesn't start peeling away because some of the Vallejo paints can be kind of fussy when a GW wash is added over the top of them. This Gulliman blue layer is just to make sure that the mid-tones and the darkest points and the brightest points all feel glued together. Now, despite doing some of my under highlighting, I still wanted some of my highlights to be more pronounced. So we're going back in on the red head section with a bit more of an orange tone to really make the front of the head pop. If whites are our brightest points, then obviously blacks are going to be our darkest points on the paint scheme. So what we have to do is create a smooth transition, and grey is the obvious choice here. We want to make sure that things are as smooth as possible, focusing in on the edges and making sure that top corner is still the brightest point on the panel. The same can be said here, we want to focus in on the edges and leave some of the top panel as bright as possible before we then go in with an even darker colour, which in this case is going to be black, in even smaller areas, just so we still have that previous grey layer gradiating up to the white, and the same grey layer transitioning down to our darkest points that are most likely going to be associated with areas around the sooty exhaust grill, and areas where dirt and dust will build up the most around the model. As I'm adding the black layer, I'm just making sure that I'm going very light on the airbrush because I don't want to lose the previous gray layer because that layer is so crucial to making this look like a natural transition from the most extreme ends of the color spectrum from black to white. The airbrush is basically scraping the very edges of the model at this point. I'd say the pressure on the airbrush too is about 70%. And because this is a metal model, I quite like to do a bunch of stages and then lock everything with a varnish. Just because of the weight of these models, it's so easy to chip them. And I like to just have a little insurance policy as I work through the painting process. One thing I really don't like doing is painting my metallics over a white layer. So I'm going to be killing a few birds with one stone here. And I'm going to be initially doing this black block out technique to stay clean and tidy. So I know exactly which areas have been painted in areas that will either require metallics or having a black outline of some sort. Because you can actually create black outlines by putting the black layer down first and then painting your next color over the top of that black layer but leaving a little bit of the black exposed to look like a sort of cartoonish outline, something you see a lot on GW paint jobs. It's not an insult, it's just the only way I know how to describe it. And if you don't have that black pre-layer, you can see here you can just do those black outlines by hand, it's just a little bit trickier sometimes. Brush size is a little bit dependent on the scale of the model with which you are painting. 
But when it comes to any of this outline work, I really recommend anything from a 1 all the way down to a triple zero in terms of thinness. One thing I've mentioned in previous videos is how metallics can be quite harsh on your brushes, so I generally like to do most of my metallic base coating with a cheap brush for as long as possible. For as I'm sure you're aware, paintbrushes are not cheap, especially your Winsor Newtons and Da Vinci brushes for example, so if you can, stick with a cheap brush for as long as possible like I'm doing here. Everything is going to get covered in a thick wash anyway, so I'm not too concerned about being particularly neat with these metallics. At this stage, I was comfortable to start putting pretty much the entire model together. So I started with the legs and putting him in those previous pins that I made, making sure that everything was nice and flush and tidy. Did one leg, then I proceeded onto the next leg, and then of course we needed to get the base ready. This is not an official GW model, so I just had to dry fit the feet to make sure they worked on the official GW base. Added the glue, realized I needed a uh, a little bit of help holding up the model. There we are, that's better. These concrete-like sections are actually just made of plaster of Paris, but the plaster of Paris had some black poster paint mixed in with it before the plaster set. The plaster was set in an old empty Ferrero Rocher tray, and as it was banged out of the tray once dried, it actually cracked quite naturally into a lot of different shapes that made convincing shapes of rubble. And I'm using a couple of these here. It's so easy to make and super cheap, and I think has quite convincing results. Because this model was only going to be made for display purposes, I wasn't too concerned about the overhang of the stones from the sides of the base. I could have cut them back, but I quite like the sort of much more natural finish that the rocks presented by leaving them uncut. Now I had some rather dodgy wood glue here that seems to have congealed since I last used it, but with a cocktail stick I managed to get some use out of it. As you can see it looks absolutely delightful. I will be obviously covering this momentarily in some different mixture of small stones and sand. And then once that's done, we're going to set everything in place with some diluted wood glue coming out of a rather broken spray bottle. I managed to get the spray bottle working enough for the sake of this video, but I have since replaced it. It looks messy, but once everything's dried, it does dry clear as wood glue and PVA glue generally does. And everything locks nicely into place, so it's not too much of an issue, especially considering it's all getting painted anyway. But to make things move a little quicker, I decided instead of just waiting for this to dry naturally, I would pull the hairdryer out and actually blast this for a few minutes to get it as hard as possible before I start painting right over the top of it. And thankfully that worked out pretty well. The other good thing about using the hairdryer is it gets rid of any of the loose stones that aren't completely nailed down with the glue. And so you don't have to worry about them flying off while you're trying to paint them later on, which can be quite annoying, because when those loose stones fall off, it leaves you with blank areas with no paint on them. The brown earth tone that's cutting through the middle of the concrete turned out not to be a particularly necessary layer after doing some airbrushing, but it's nice to have that texture cut through in places, as you'll see later on when I've developed a little bit more of the painting on this base. But I'm doing some very generic techniques here, just doing some dry brushing with some lighter colors, and then I'll be moving in with a wash just to create some contrast of the rocks between the concrete slabs. And to make those rocks feel a bit more blended into the environment, they will in fact be getting the same paint process as the concrete slabs that surround them. Painting all these tiny rocks is a bit of a time sink, but it's well worth it, just making sure that everything looks like it has continuity and is all from the same environment and nothing sort of stands out of place. And once I finish painting all those rocks, as you can see here, you can see the brown layer is slightly redundant, but also it still cuts through as I previously mentioned, which is quite nice. Now I'm going in with an additional highlight. This time I'm not using a dry brush, but actually using an airbrush for the first time. I thought it was okay to do that because these are such large and flat areas. The airbrush wasn't gonna give me too many problems. Now you're actually starting to see the airbrushes taking over some of the areas in the middle of the stones. I will attempt to address that with an additional wash later and a further highlight, but it's not too bad once everything's dried. 
think if you've got too many oily pools of Agrax Earthshade sitting in the earthy sections, things can look a little bit odd. But there's enough shine there that it looks like little pools of black water or something like that. And then this final dry brush that you're seeing added over the top holds everything together quite nicely. This final highlight was used the most sparingly because you don't want to be putting such a super bright highlight in too many places on such big flat areas as things can start to look quite unrealistic quite quickly. If you want to spice things up even more, you can add additional washes such as some greens to imply that there's moss growing on the stones or actually adding flock and types of basing material just to give it a bit more flavor. I decided against that just because I wanted things to feel as barren and as stark as possible with the Titan being the main focal point of this piece. Just so the Warhound wasn't getting completely swamped in brassy trims and metallic silver mechanisms, I found this really nice dark bronze color that I used in a few places just to create a little bit more visual intrigue. The only metallics left to worry about were the brass trims of the entire model. This was the most time consuming part of the paint project. You just really have to take your time and make sure you don't make any mistakes because obviously you're going to be spending more time trying to fix them otherwise. For these sections, I like to use a very nice stiff brush with a very fine point just because you want to make sure that metallic paint is going exactly on those high ridges and nowhere else. Just making sure that I use the edge of my brush in most instances, especially on these long flat sections like this. And just really making sure that every single point that I make is deliberate, but light to the touch. You don't want to press down too hard, otherwise you're going to start smudging and getting bulbous bits of paint rather than the accurate sections that you really require. Now on one of those rivets, you can see that I did make a bit of an error, but that's an easy fix with just adding a little bit of black paint again around said rivet. That's not too much of an issue, but as soon as you start hitting any of those blue sections, then you might start running into problems trying to match the color with that transition. So if you can, just keep things as tight as possible. This brass color definitely requires two or three coats even to get a nice full finish. Once I was finished with the brass trim, I moved over to some additional silver parts that I needed to do. Now, this particular silver is the metal color range by Vallejo. And I love this stuff. It comes out super thin, but has such great pigment content to it. Super bright and super full. I highly recommend the Vallejo Metal Color Range if you can get a hold of it. Now, it does say in the graphics that I added the Non Oil to the dark silver sections, but I actually added the Non Oil to basically the entirety of the model because I wanted the entire model to have this sort of greasy, oily, overall dirty finish to it. So I actually covered the white and the blue sections like you can see here, but it pulls the entire model together in a way that really looked very, very appropriate once everything had dried. The red parts were actually covered with Agrax Earthshade instead of Nuln Oil. Now, this is already quite a long video, so to save time, I decided that I wouldn't show every single part of the model getting painted. But here's the thing. If there is a part, say a red part that you're seeing in the video, for example, the princeps that are also red, just know that they have the exact same painting process as the head or any part of the model that has been painted on camera is the same painting process that would be used for a similar color that you'll see elsewhere on the model. Now we're just going to move on to the lenses of the Warhound head, starting off with a very simple flat red, making sure that we keep the black up in the top corner of the lens, but pulling a brighter and brighter tone into the front and center of the lens by moving through some oranges and then to some yellows, and then finishing with a white lens flare around the rim of the back edge and bottom edge of the lens. The process used for doing the lens highlighting is called glazing. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but if you're not, basically you get a small amount of paint, generally quite wet and quite diluted, but also with a slightly dry brush, 
and you scrape the paint in a specific direction that you're trying to create a new transitional colour from a previous one. That's probably not the best way of describing it, but that's basically how I would describe it when I'm doing glazing. Now, my brush is quite wet when I was doing these particular lens highlights. I do recommend the brush being a little bit drier. And the way to do this is get the paint thinned down a fair amount. It's a sort of airbrush thinness if you're familiar with airbrushing. And then you want to load your brush, but then slightly dab it off onto a kitchen towel or something like that, as long as you're not putting fibers back onto the brush. And then you slowly slide the brush in a specific direction that you need the paint to go in. And then that basically, that final point where the brush stops is where the paint will mostly remain. And that sliding point that you create across the surface of the area that you're painting creates that smooth transition of color over the previous color that you painted. And then once the brightness towards the front of the lens was addressed, I then brought back in some of that black towards the rear of the lens one last time with a final glaze. Now on to chipping. I just use the regular sponge technique where you dab a little bit of paint onto a sponge and then lightly add it onto the surface that you want to chip away at. Do not press down hard with the sponge, otherwise you'll end up with a complete mess. On the white side, we're actually going to be using the chipping technique with Rhinox Hide, and we won't be doing too much more apart from that. We're going to be smudging it ever so slightly with some dry brushing, then we're going to use that same Rhinox Hide and go back to the initial blue chipping and darken some of those areas to make it look like the paint has been chipped away to the metal underneath. I also decided to put a couple of cheeky scratches with the Rhinox Hide. You can highlight this with the previous blue, but I decided to just keep the scratches a little bit more discreet and not bring too much attention to them, instead letting the chipping do the work instead. Now you can use oil paints as well and dry brush the oil paints down across the surface of the panel, but I didn't really want to get too heavy into doing oil paints and such because that's a big time sink with having to do glass varnish and things like that. So I just moved on to adding the wash around the brass trim and then also doing the highlights after that. We're using Auric Gold here while making sure not to add it to every single part of the brass trim, but instead corners and areas that I just thought needed a little bit of extra expression. And then I was done with that. Once I was satisfied with the gold highlights over the brass trim, I moved on to highlighting the silver sections. This was done with a slightly dry brush-like brush. It's not a full dry brush, it's not as stiff as a dry brush, but it's got that sort of half stiffness and a little bit of painterly quality to it so I could just kind of quickly go around the model instead of getting too heavy into the dry brushing. And then I moved on to just painting the rim of the base in the classic steel lesion drab color. I'd say about two to three coats generally does this nice and solid. I like to use a hairdryer in between layers just so I can get it done nice and quickly, but do be careful if the paint's too thin, that hairdryer can push that paint around real quick and cause painting tears. If you know anything about painting tears, they're very annoying. Finally, I get to now put the fully painted model onto its base and get ready to do the beauty shots on the, the rotary table that I have in my photo booth. A few things that I said were done off camera. For example, a major one is the weapons, but every single color that you see on the weapons follows the same painting scheme as I previously mentioned for all the other colors that I did show in this video. I let the glue set for this for a few hours, and then I got to putting everything together for the final presentation. Well, it wouldn't be a modern video if I didn't wait until the very end to tell you the thing that I promised I'd tell you at the beginning of the video. So, what is Forumware? In short, it is a fan-made project 
It could either be a remake of a model that already exists in the Games Workshop or Warhammer Universe as it were, or it could actually be a model that has only been written about and has never been actually made. I can tell from the actual striations on this particular model that this was most likely 3D printed and then recast in metal. Now, I actually bought two of these models in era when I first started getting back into Epic. I had no idea what forumware was. The seller on eBay did not mention that these were forumware. They were just two Warhound Titans in metal, and I assumed that they were just legit models. And even though they are not legit models, I'm still glad that I have them in my collection. It's interesting seeing fans take things into their own hands and filling a gap in the market before Games Workshop does by doing something like AT18. And although this model is finished, I do have a twin brother sitting in a box that could do with being painted in a Traitor Legion color scheme one day. Thank you so much for watching until the end. I hope you enjoyed the video as much as I did in painting this little forum where Ligio Osadex Warhound Titan. Until next time, I'm Vince, signing off from here at Bunker 6.